Tanya Lee. I'm the author of this book, Land's End, and I want to take you on a brief visual tour through the landscape so that you can get a sense of the place and the people that I'm going to be describing. So we're starting here with a map which shows Sulawesi right in the center of the Indonesian archipelago. It's a narrow island with mountains that reach almost down to the sea and you can see here the very rugged landscape. Really no coastal plain, um, just mountains and sea and a lot of people living in those hills. If you approach the area along the coast you see simple fishing boats, wooden fishing boats. It's a very modest fishing economy. Other kinds of livelihood include things like cutting firewood for sale. The main one is coconuts, which have been planted on this area since 1900. And here's a guy climbing a coconut tree to pluck the fruit. Um, here he's taking off the outer husk, outer shell, uh, loading the fruit into a cart for transportation and taking it to the yard where it's going to be dried under fire and then loaded into trucks and in the old days it was lo uh, loaded into the boats which went along the coast there. Here's the house of the owner of one of these coconut groves. I mentioned in the book that the ownership of these groves has become very concentrated over the years so just a few people own almost all of them and most people live like this in small huts underneath the trees which they don't own themselves. They work in that sector. Trade's another big part of the coastal economy um, here you see women who have, actually they're coastal women, they hiked up into the lower hills to buy vegetables grown by the mountain women. They take them then down to the market where they sell. Trade, small scale trade anyway, is very much a women's domain. Here's a woman also with her small dry goods store selling the typical items, um, cooking oil, packaged noodles, cans of sardines, cookies, flashlight batteries, that kind of thing. There's a regular weekly market in which people buy uh, larger household items and enjoy. It's considered a social event. People go there even if they don't plan to buy anything, sit and hang out with their friends. Here are some people who've come down from the mountains to the market and they're visible and obvious because of their haircuts, the bundles that they're carrying. They often come with blowpipes and parangs and these kinds of things mark them out as mountain people. They tend to get a lot of scorn from the coastal folk. Development is another element of the coastal scene. This is a scene, a village planning event. You'll notice that the village headman is using a, a megaphone, even though it's a small room. That's part of marking it out as an official event. And also the layout with the planners sitting in front and the rest of the people sitting in the back, sitting in the audience, and all of the men, as you'll notice. This is one of the rare planning events which I saw, which actually went on in the hills, although not very far inside the hills. And again, the marking of space is interesting because the officials are sitting in chairs and the villagers are crouched behind and ended up not saying much during that meeting, even though it was supposed to be a consultation. Most people, though, really only know this whole area from the coast. They drive through these small market towns along the coastal road. And all of those mountains which loom off in the distance is a place that, that they would really never visit and they would never have an occasion to visit. That, though, is my objective, and I want to introduce you here to Rina, who is my research assistant and Laoji language translator. She lived right down by the coast, just by those fishing boats, and she came with me on my hikes into the hills. In the early days, the way up into the highlands mainly involved fording rivers like this. In fact, the whole highlands could be impassable at times when the major ri rivers were in flood. It also involved hiking on trails. Eventually, after 2000, some of these were developed into motorbike trails like this one. And you could hire a motorbike taxi like this guy to convey you up there. But these trails really didn't extend very far, not more than about a kilometer in land. Highlanders were busy trying to build their own trails to extend the network. But vehicle passable roads were really scarce and didn't go very far and they really only began to be built after around 2005. We're up in the mountains now and looking down from the first row of foothills just back towards the coast in that stretch of coconuts along the coastal strip there. This is the house of a tobacco planter. In fact, the you can see tobacco drying in the back there. That was the economy which was prevalent here in the past. We stayed at this house and here we are in the kitchen. Rina and the house owner 
amazingly managing to produce food, not just for the guests, but for all the friends and neighbors who came to join in the event. And here we are the morning after, people gathering for a farewell photo. Some of the houses were a bit more substantial, like this one. A lot of them were really very tiny and very precarious. And so Rina and I couldn't stay there for very many days. We, we would crowd out the residents, so we just would stay for one or two days and then move on. A lot of our research involved stopping and chatting to people in the fields, stopping people when they were taking a break from their work and chatting. This woman is weeding using the flat bladed weeding knife. Most of our research though involved sitting with people in their houses and talking to them. So here's the anthropologist in a typical pose with notebook and a bottle of water by my side chatting to people on the veranda. The landscape is very rugged. I included these shots just to show you how steeply sloped is the land and also how far apart the houses. You have to walk really quite a long way to get from one house to the next. There's no concentrated villages. So how do people live in these hills? Obviously they were mainly farmers. This is a woman uh, harvesting a crop of rice. She's using the small, a single bladed harvesting knife, which is used all over Southeast Asia, and she produced a magnificent crop. Growing rice took a lot of work though, including guarding. Here's an older woman with her grandchildren who's been tasked with sitting and frightening away the birds. A lot of people found rice production a pretty time consuming and onerous enterprise. Corn was the other main food crop. In order to grow it though, you had to build a pretty strong fence because the wild pigs very much like to invade the corn. After the corn had been harvested, some of it was hung on these racks here to dry where it could be eaten over the next six months. You would take it down and take off the husks and grind them as this woman is doing. Cash crops have been there for a long time. Tobacco I've already mentioned. Um, this one is ground nuts. Shallots were a big one. Here's a couple planting shallots, a bunch of boys weeding some shallots in a field. And here's a gathering of men and girls who have gathered in one evening to clean and prepare the shallots for taking down to market. Taking them down involved, of course, carrying them since there were no roads. So portering was another source of livelihood, especially for younger men. And it involved weighing the amount that he was carrying. This guy's got probably about 40 kilos, a large load. The big change which came in the Highlands during the period of my research, and that's one of the big focuses of the book, is the introduction of tree crops. Here you can see in a field which was previously full of rice, kapok trees have now been planted. This is a, an early experiment people had with cocoa trees planted under kapok. Kapok produces this fluffy stuff which is used to fill mattresses and pillows. Cloves were another crop, that's a, a clove grove in the foreground. The main one though is cocoa, and here's a grove of cocoa trees with someone's house. After the pods have been harvested, they have to be split and the fleshy seed taken out. If that's an enjoyable activity, people sit in the evenings um, splitting the pods and doing that work, and then they carry them home to dry on these drying platforms. The cocoa economy brought a lot of new money into the hills. This is the house of uh, a cocoa trader who had set up there. He was actually from the mountain area but had prospered as a trader. Here he is in his house and the sign on the wall behind him, I took a picture of this, it says, for all you people who've taken cash advances, don't forget you need to pay them back when you harvest. So relations of credit and debt were also part of this new cocoa economy. Some people really prospered through this economy. This is a family that had, had done fairly well. Uh, people were able to build better houses like this one, it's another one of the new houses that came up on the proceeds of Coco. Some children were also able to go to school, some small mountain schools were built, and people generally just had more money to do things like that, though it was still very uneven. These children did not go to school, and this couple is just one of many who ended up without any land because they were unable to compete in the cocoa economy and they ended up pretty much impoverished by it. Life in the hills wasn't all farming, as a lot of gathering, spending time with friends and family, also ritual events. This is some shots of a ceremony which I mentioned in the book, the one which invokes the spirits of the earth and the water and tries to bring good health for people and for crops, uh, health and prosperity. Here's the ritual specialist actually addressing the earth, where the spirits of the earth are located. Now we're going to move further into the interior, into what I call in the book the inner hills. And you know it by the larger trees which have been cut down to make the fields, 
um, heavy trunks, which are, in fact, in this case, they didn't burn very well, so they're just being left to rot, and eventually that field will be planted. More emphasis on root crops, like this little grove of root crops, and houses, which are which use rattan leaves especially as the main form of roofing. Fairly rugged life up there in the inner hills. Here's a guy making a blowpipe and a young couple hiking down to the market actually with their blowpipe, uh, hoping to find some wild pig to hunt on the way down. A rattan collection is one of the sources of income up there. Um, here's some guys hiking down with their loads of rattan. To meet the people, old guys like this always love to chat and spend. I spend a lot of time talking to this man and others like him about the history of the area. Women were often shy, eventually got used to us. Here's some shots just from inside one of those houses, a few days that we spent in this area talking to these particular people. Young women do what mums do everywhere, trying to take care of their children. Here's a woman bathing her baby inside that house using some bottled water which is brought up from the river. And here she has him in one of the traditional wooden cradles. Taking care of kids is a struggle. The level of infant mortality is very high. Men also participate. Children of this age, after they've been weaned, two or three, don't do very well in terms of nutrition and general health status. As they get older though, those that survive, you know, they turn into healthy young kids and they participate in everyday events. So here's a girl going on a hunting expedition actually with her father and her uncle. Missions have come into this area. That's one of the big changes in the inner hills. This is a, one of the mountain churches, bridge built by one of the churches trying to encourage children to go to school um, by making the river more possible for them. And a lot of emphasis on housing, uh, trying to encourage people to build houses gathered close together so that they could more easily attend both school and church. But that was a difficult struggle because their livelihoods, especially their farming, really required them still to move together with their farms. So a lot of these houses were in fact empty. Some people in the inner hills also prospered from the new economy. This is quite far inland, about six or seven hours walk, but this guy had done extremely well out of his clothes production and these are some of the material goods that he had been able to afford as a result. Some people up there though were still, this is a picture from 2006, pretty much in the same state they had been when I first started doing this research in 1990 and still leading pretty hard lives. The main a big change that I discuss in the book and that's coming along now is the disease in the cocoa. Here you can see diseased cocoa trees. So as cocoa dies off, some other changes will come into these highlands. In other parts of the province, oil palm, this is in the palms in the front and the factory in the distance. That's one of the new crops coming in, but it has really very little role for smallholders and people like those mountain folk. So the future for them is very much in question. Mm -hmm.